in the future of work. My name is Sahil Ramkilawan from SHL and I'll be your host for today. I hold the position of solution leader for talent management at SHL and I'm a registered psychometrist and have been in industry for about nine years. I'm really passionate about utilizing technology, data and insights to inform people decisions and drive business success. And today I'm joined by two incredible speakers, Lucy Beaumont and Jörn Danheimer. Lucy and Jörn, can you please do a quick introduction for our audience? Um, Lucy, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sahail. I'm Lucy Beaumont and I'm also a chartered psychologist and a solution lead for talent management at SHL. I actually joined SHL late last year, uh, following many years with Corn Ferry and about 15 years in the talent management industry. Super. And I'm Ewan Danheimer. Um, I initially joined the industry as intern in 2002 and have been with SHL for a couple of years, also as, as organizational psychologist in different roles, currently as business development director. Thanks, Sahil. Awesome. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Ewan. Really excited about today's discussion. Now, for those of you that don't know, for over 40 years, SHL's talent acquisition and talent management solutions have supported organizations build skilled, motivated, diverse, and capable workforces, giving you a live view of what your talent looks like so that you can make informed people decisions. And thank you so much for joining us today. Perhaps you have joined because like many organizations, you are seeing that shift in how work is done, where work is done, and who is doing that work, especially with the rise of tech and artificial intelligence. You might also be wondering about what sort of technology you need to address those current needs um, and those needs of the future, and then also how this supports your organization strategy. And like many others, you might be adapting your approach, your processes, and how you manage talent within your organization, given all of this change. Now, some of the context that we fall into in terms of everything that's going on, the backdrop of things like the global talent shortage. So a recent study by the Manpower Group from this year, 2023, revealed that today, 77% of employers report difficulty in filling roles, a 17 year high in terms of what those challenges have looked like. And with the rise in technology like generative AI and large language models or LLMs, organizations are facing a very different challenge than we have before. So in today's discussion, with this rapid expansion of technology around us, we're going to be unpacking the following three areas. Firstly, we're gonna chat through and explore the future of work and share a practitioner's perspective around this. And Lucy's gonna drive that part of the discussion for us. Then we will discuss the impact of this on HR, specifically on your people, your tech and your talent strategy. And Jörn's gonna lead up that part for us. And then finally, I'm gonna discuss the impact of this on employees, focusing on the employee experience, employee-led careers, and also changing career expectations. And then we're going to wrap up the session by discussing some quick takeaways from our end and take any unanswered questions from our audience if time allows. We will be checking the comments and questions regularly, so please feel free to join us in the discussion, challenge our thinking, share your opinions, and feel free to agree or disagree with us. We really want to have that robust conversation with you today. So to get things started, Lucy, I know you've got a question for our audience. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, I certainly can. So to get things warmed up for everybody, we are going to do a word cloud. So on screen, you will shortly be able to see a QR code, which you can just scan with your phone, and then you will be able to answer the following question. So the question is, when you think of the future of work, what comes to mind? So I'll just give you a few seconds to scan that code, and then we should start seeing uh, our word clouding, cloud forming around us. And look, what I will say is that this is a big and diverse topic. We are certainly seeing the media picking it up and there's lots of hype and headlines that we see, often gloom and doom, I will say, because I guess the world is ending, sounds much more appealing than the world is changing, but it will be okay. Um, but there are going to obviously be challenges that we're talking about today, as well as opportunities when we think about the future of work. So Hale, for you, what comes to mind when you think about the future of work? Hmm. Quite a few things. And, and I think what's top of mind for me right now is almost that digital partnership and collaboration with technology and machines. And um, Jörn, from your side, what, what do you think about when you, when you think of the future of work? Yeah, I would say discomfort, uncertainty, which all leads to mistakes. Um, but it also on the flip side, opportunities to grow and evolve. 
Um, I see there's a whole bunch of words coming up there now. So remote AI, so technology, flexibility, diversity, definitely very topical. Lucy, I don't know what you guys think about those. I think the sheer volume of words that are coming up sort of shows how much of a big capital topic this is. Um, but there's lots of you know positive things in here, excited, more creative, ever changing, um, as well as some of those, you know, I think uncertainty is a big one. We probably feel quite uncertainty about what the future of work will look like, which is why it's getting so much attention today. So go on and uh, put in a few more words there and we can see what else is coming through. But AI and flexibility and remote seem to be the biggest um, yeah. words that are coming to mind. Yeah, I see on the on the edges, we're seeing some chat GPT, some employee experience as well, the global workforce, um, <laughs> new skills and reskilling. Yep, robots, um, ever changing, really nice one. Great, awesome. should we go ahead and close that down? Yep, perfect. So feel free to keep bombing them in if you do have that code. Um, I'm going to jump back to um, to the discussion that we're having now. And, and thank you so much for your participation. This was just to get us warmed up um, and excited about it. Um, we're thinking about this in the very in a very similar way, which is awesome to see. Um, and with that, Lucy, I think it's a great time for us to kick off with your with the first section and your view on the future of work. What have you seen, heard, and experienced? Yeah, I mean, I think just reflecting again on the word cloud, it is such a big topic. Um, you know, it's clearly vast, it's a big catch-all term. What we do know is that it isn't a fad or something that we're just talking about. We know that the world is changing. We are going through a shift that many of us will never have been through in our careers to date. The World Economic Forum are actually calling this the fourth industrial revolution. And that really leans into the speed of change in which we're experiencing this, as well as the depth and breadth of the change. And I don't know about your experiences, Sahel and Yern, but I have lots of clients that are asking questions about this. What should I be thinking about? And the feeling that I get is they're probably a little bit overwhelmed. So I try and break it down into four practical areas that HR need to be mindful of today with a view on their talent strategy. So you can see these on screen. We've got where we work, of course, why we actually work, who is in the workforce, and critically, what work we do and how is that going to change with automation coming in more and more into the job space. So I'll take a few moments just to walk through each of these, starting with where we work. So this is, of course, a topic that everybody has been brought into over the past few years for obvious reasons. Um, and we're all navigating this question of hybrid, remote, in-office options. And I don't think that we've settled yet. I think that we're still going through some of these changes. What I think is quite interesting is just reflecting on the people that we're working with and what situations they're in. And Jörn and Sahel, I know you both have particularly interesting work and home life setups. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about what your setup is? Mm, sure, Lucy. So I'm currently based in South Africa, but I do work full time for the Australian SHL office and customer base on a daily basis. So um, pros and cons to it, yeah. That's a big commute. Um, and Sahel, what about you? Yeah, so I'm also from South Africa initially, but I've recently relocated to the Netherlands. I've been here for about two months. Um, so from the SHL South Africa offices to our offices in Utrecht. Great. And Jan, you mentioned there are definitely pros and cons to the setup that you have. Could you just share a few of those with us? Yeah, sure. So in my mind, pros, the very simple pro is the possibility of doing work. It's just a lot more accessible. Um, the reach and range of where you can work is far greater than before the pandemic or we adopted this kind of a work lifestyle. Um, and also the flexibility and that's the commitment and loyalty from employees like myself that, uh, that and that this drive. So I think those are for me really good positives. On the flip side, some of the cons Work-life balance, obviously, as we all know for years already, but for me personally, the learning has been trying to be disciplined with maintaining that, and I don't always get that right. Um, efficiencies, so I find that for myself and for colleagues, we're not as efficient, so it takes sometimes longer to give and to get answers. And just the, the general connection with colleagues, face-to-face -face connection, obviously one misses that. Um, so those are some of the, the cons for me. I don't know, Sahel, if you see that similarly or, or differently from your side. 
Yeah, I definitely resonate with a lot of that um, in terms of what you shared, both on the pros and cons side. Um, so yeah, nothing, nothing more to add there. Thanks, Ian. I think what is really interesting about both of your experiences is the fact that you have such flexible work options have allowed you to remain in a specific job and organization, even though you're having sort of huge changes in where you live. I think if we go back five or 10 years, if you were moving to a different country, that would almost certainly have meant having to find a new job um, in that location. So, you know, and that flexibility has obviously opened up opportunities and that's a big win, obviously for you, but massively so for, for FHL. And I think for many organisations, this pivot to remote and hybrid work, it felt like it might be the go forward approach, even following the pandemic. It was almost a real time experiment through the pandemic. And for many employees and companies, it seems like it worked. But we've definitely seen over the last few months, many organisations and some quite high profile ones mandating more of a back to work policy. What's interesting here, I think, is that pre-pandemic, the power in the decision here was very much in the organization's hands. They set the rules. I certainly never heard of a job candidate asking a potential employer, would I actually have to come into the office if I was successful in this job? You know, it just wasn't up for debate. But today we are seeing the power in deciding where work takes place actually shifting to the employee. We know that 48% of employees um, in a recent survey said they would definitely be seeking a full-time remote position next. One in three British workers say they would rather quit than come to the office every day. Uh, that's some LinkedIn research. And Corn Ferry actually found that to remain in a hybrid role with a 30-minute commute, employers would need to offer them a 10 to 20% pay rise. I guess these are a little bit hypothetical, right? It's research. Um, it's quite easy to respond to a survey and say, look, I would quit if I had to be in the office every day or I'd demand a pay rise. Um, but we're seeing this play out in real life with lots of organizations actually starting to initiate these back to work policies. Um, we know that in the UK, office occupancy has risen. It's at an all time high as it, as it has been um, for the last two years, but that's still only around 35% of employees actually going back into the office. And that was around 80% pre pandemic. So we're definitely not seeing the footfall back to the office in practical terms. We're also able to watch some of these high profile, profile organizations in action. So you may have seen this, you probably have seen this. Amazon mandated a back-to-work policy, which resulted in employees actually staging a walkout. And what I thought was particularly interesting is that they had a petition that sat alongside this, which read, employees need a say in decisions that affect our lives. Again, I just can't imagine that being voiced pre-pandemic, right? We, you know, we wouldn't have even occurred to us that we should ask employees if it's okay for you to come into the office. Um, and do your work from there. But I think the reality is that today, the employee voice counts for more. Employees have more agency than ever before to define where and how they work. And organizations really need to take this into careful consideration when they are setting these types of policies, because it will impact the talent that they attract during recruitment, but also the retention of their people. And I don't think that there's a silver bullet when it comes to answering this question. Should you be back in the office? Should you have a hybrid situation? But wherever you land, the one thing I would say is just be really mindful of the consequences that that decision and policy can have on your talent strategy. Moving on a little bit to why we work. Um, I think understanding why people come to work can be a real differentiator when it comes to attracting and retaining talent in your business. And we've seen changes in the space, too, in terms of employee expectations. If we go back in time, um, you know, we think when people had a job for life, the expectations were probably a lot lower, right? And again, the power was with the employer. It was very much fair pay for a fair day's work. And that was really all that we had to think about. Like, are we paying you appropriately? And you're going to come in and do your job. We then saw this shift to deeper psychological needs. And I guess a focus on some of those intrinsic motivators that really drive performance, um, connection, meaning, purpose, things like that. But what we're seeing sort of post pandemic and very much in the last year or so is really this conversation is evolving further to well-being needs. Thinking about mental health at work and work-life balance, that's already come up in our conversation today. And I think it's just going to become increasingly important, particularly as technology infiltrates the workplace and we continue with this always-on culture. 
We actually did some research at SHL on this to look at how motivators of employees actually changed pre and post pandemic. Um, and what we found was that the pandemic really did change us. So it gave people fresh perspectives and allowed them the opportunity to actually consider what they want from work and you know what they're willing to put up with. So you can see some of the results, high level results of this uh, research on screen. And what you're seeing is on the left hand side, these things, these are things that became increasingly demotivating following the pandemic. And on the right hand side, th these are things that people are actually more motivated by post pandemic. So I'll just give you a moment or, th or two to just look through that and, um, and see if that resonates with you. Jan, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Lucy, I mean, this really resonates with me. Uh, the fact that our research showed that our levels of adaptability and resilience have declined following mm -hmm. the pandemic shows that you know, people are generally um, find it harder to bounce back from difficulties. And it may also mean that people just don't want to take as much risk. I mean, that's, that's a reality. Um, the demotivating impact of the lack of clarity definitely found post-pandemic also makes complete sense. You know, the challenge is though, that we are in a rapidly changing world and clarity can be difficult to give and will be even more difficult to give in future. So that'll be a, a difficult one. Mm. Um, but there's also a greater emphasis on, on personal time and achieving a better balance, you know, similar to what I spoke about, instead of putting up with excessive work stresses. So I think that's that's a very positive element there. And, and the flip side also that people are more motivated, motivated by purpose. You know, we see that we see that actually people leaving jobs where they don't or where they're not aligned to the organization and the values of the organization. Um, yeah, so I think for me, all of this boils down to how we as an organization, as HR and as teams design workplaces um, that can attract and retain top talent. We need to really think about how we create a culture where people can feel valued, they can grow, they can find that purpose. And I think if we get that, that recipe right, I think we've got a, a better better recipe than a better mix. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think we're all feeling almost the impact of this still in how we work today. Um, unfortunately, we know that feeling of being valued and being developed isn't a given in many organizations. Um, Lucy, you also mentioned that part about who's in the workforce. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is really thinking about the changing demographics of the labour force. So we should be thinking about the global population and looking at how we can reflect and represent these demographics within the workplace. So we know that there's a talent shortage. You've already talked about that. Um, in fact, it's estimated that by 2030, there'll be a global talent shortage of more than 85 million people. To put that into context, that's roughly equivalent to the population of Germany. And that's quite relevant today because a big part of this conversation is that people are worried that robots are going to take our jobs. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on a quote that I saw that I think is really nice giving some perspective here. The quote reads, the biggest issue isn't that robots are taking all of the jobs, it's that there aren't enough humans to fill them. So with a shortage of humans to fill roles, perhaps we actually need to think more diversely about who is in the workforce and how we can make it inclusive for different types of people. A good example is, you know, globally, we have an aging population. The fastest growing age group today is actually those aged 65 plus. And yet the workplace just isn't supportive of older workers. Um, we actually have been doing some research and, and some work with clients at, at SHL, which has helped clients uncover and discover that actually 100% their entire senior leadership team could be set to retire in the next five years. So that's a really scary amount of you know, knowledge and experience and institutional wisdom that's going to be walking out the door in the next five years. Doesn't mean that these people couldn't continue to um, stay in the organization and work, but we're just not set up to do that. And so we just can't go forward and continue to make the workplace non-viable for older workers. We need to think about how we manage and support this population so that they do want to remain in some form of employment for longer. And so, Hale, I know that we're going to be coming back to this topic of multiple generations in the workplace, which again is an interesting dynamic that we should be um, taking consideration of. So let me just touch on what work we do and the role that technology and automation might play in that. 
so this is the great battle between robots and humans. Um, I was pleased to see robots come up on our word cloud earlier. But I think a lot of employees are definitely worried about this. Is this concept that robots or automation may in, in the very near future take over their job? And honestly, I actually think it's a very real concern that we shouldn't shy away from. I don't think we can shy away from it. We know that the advances in technology are going to be creating greater efficiencies over and above human processes. Um, so I thought I'd share with you a real example of how robots have actually fared against uh, humans when it came to customer service. So this is a story that you might have actually seen in the press recently. Um, it was uh, put out into broadsheets and it's about a large energy company. They're based in the UK and they're called Octopus. And back in December last year, they actually started training an AI bot to respond to customer service queries. And they let it run for 16 weeks of training it, giving it a go. Then they stopped and reviewed and sort of thought, well, how did it go? How did the robots perform? Were they better or were they worse than humans? Um, and it's an interesting question. I am going to put you both on the spot. Jan and Sahail, I want to know who you would put your money on, robots or humans? I'll go humans. I think uh, I think I'll go robots for this one. Okay, Jan has more faith in us humans. Well, in actual fact, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Jan, but the hell is correct. The AI bot was actually able to do the job of 250 people, and not just do it, but do it significantly better than us mere mortal humans um, in delivering customer service. So customer service ratings actually rose from 65% with just humans to 80% when they were using AI. And I think this really goes to show that we are going to see changes in jobs um, with tech definitely replacing certain roles. But at the same time, it is going to generate new roles and new jobs and new opportunities. And again, I just go back to that quote that we saw earlier, uh, you know, the biggest issue isn't that robots are taking all of the jobs, it's that there aren't enough humans to fill them. So we really need to think about how we design jobs and organisations around technology. Um, and on that note, Sahel, I don't know if we've got any questions, but I guess the question becomes, how should HR respond? Hmm. Yes, Lucy, indeed. And I think, Jörn, um, here, this takes us nicely into your section in terms of talking about the impact on HR in terms of people, tech, and talent strategies. Uh, do you mind sharing a bit more about us? Mm. And I will also say I will not lose faith in humans. So even though the robots won. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in my mind, it all depends on, on how HR responds to the changes. So do they see it as a challenge or do they see it as an opportunity? And if it's a challenge, then we'll feel threatened, we'll feel incapable and just maintain the status quo. If we, however, see it as an opportunity, then we'll be inquisitive and progressive and adopt a growth mindset and therefore can create a lot more. Um, is an interesting study I found previously uh, from Dave Ulrich and his team, where over a 30 year period, they did about seven independent reviews on the simple question of how has HR's performance or capabilities improved over the 30 year period? And their, their data clearly showed that HR had improved on areas such as HR delivery, uh, response to change, which is great, alignment to business and business needs, and also personal proficiency. So this in itself, but also just even our practical on the ground experience of all of you that, that are listening as well, I'm sure is very reassuring that there's change, but HR is evolving and has been evolving. If you look at the slide that you have there, those are the three areas, the people, the technical processes and talent strategy. And there's a lot of opportunity to cover in this, but I think let's, let me zoom in a little bit more into the people aspect there. Um, and in the people side, whether these are your employees, your applicants, or your line managers, for me, one of the first realities there is about mixed generations equals mixed expectations. So if we look at the world and the mixed generational workforce is currently at play, and this is not just now age-based, so baby boomers and generation X and so on, but also influenced by mindsets, we can broadly see three revolutions over the decades. So the first was the industrial revolution or the survival mode, so similar to what Lucy spoke about, and here, most employees had little or any job choice. You know, their, their occupation or even their job was their career. Um, and they were often stuck with the employer, which led to a false sense of loyalty amongst the employer and employee. Then this evolved, obviously, into the information revolution, 
And here employees had now survived the industrial revolution, but now had suddenly more job opportunities and job options at, at their fingertips. So we started looking at the standard of living instead of just surviving. Um, and here now employees were perceived as less loyal, but only due to there being more job choice and also the higher demand for skills as well. And very much where we are now is the move towards the social revolution where the focus is moved towards the quality of living. Um, here we focus on how we live and work, the environment that we work and live in, the impact we have on this environment and others, and obviously how we exercise our personal choices and responsibilities. And this is very much the revolution that HR is facing at the moment, and it's challenging. Yeah, yeah, and I, that does make a lot of sense, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Um, I mean, if we look at career paths and the expectations inherent with building careers, how should HR manage that you know, nowadays, currently? Yeah, that's another very important point. It's almost a, a second reality for me in terms of the impact on the people element of or, and how HR has to handle that is that part around career paths. Historically, we have always defined career paths based on the destination or the ultimate outcome. So I must get job X or I must get job Y, which is predominantly driven by the organizational needs. But what if the destination keeps moving, keeps changing, uh, i.e. the jobs keep evolving? And what if the currency of today is no more the abundance of job opportunities, so meaning the employer has it upper hand, but the scarce availability of actual talent, the meaning the applicant actually has the upper hand. So these realities force us in HR to change our focus from managing careers that are um, organizationally led destinations to rather managing, as, managing them as employee led journey. And that's where for me, HR needs to draw a parallel between planning a career and planning a road trip. You know, if you look at it from a destination point of view, we obsess about the final outcome. But what if that road that we are planning to drive on to get to that final outcome suddenly has got bad weather, storms and social unrest, and we can't drive on that road anymore and we need to reroute somewhere else, but still get to the same destination. In this process, we often miss the numerous hidden learning opportunities presented en route while we are rerouting because we're still so focused on the destination. With an experience focus, however, though, we know that yes, we want to get to the destination, that point. However, though, we're inquisitive, we're flexible, we're streetwise, we're resilient. And because of that, we embrace numerous experiences en route as learning opportunities to really grow on the go as you're busy with our careers. It, it brings you back also to the saying of Harley Davidson for many years already. It's about the journey, not the destination. And I think for me, that's a big part that HR needs to try and transition into and is how do we think differently about those career journeys versus those career paths? Um, yeah, also it takes me to the, to the next point around the people, which is what good talent looks like. Now, we have for many years in SHL and our colleagues outside of SHL have often spoken about what does good talent look like and ask this question. So it's not a new question at all, but I think it's becoming more and more critical in this changing world. And if you think back to the old saying, you hire me because of my experience and knowledge, but you fire me because of my behavior. Well, the question here is really, what are you looking for? Is it backward looking attainments or is it forward looking potential? And more and more we see companies taking up the skills based hiring, which moves away from the traditional backward looking approaches to more forward looking potential approaches. And very simply, the practical implications here are as follows, I mean, if you look at a backward looking attainment approach, in this approach, we really maintain the status quo. We more deeply embed biases amongst us and ultimately just this contract our talent pool that we can uh, work with. Now, in some stable work context and environment, that may be fine where things don't change. However, not the case where the context is changing. And that's where we look at a forward looking potential skills base. Here we focus rather on the underlying innate characteristics instead of those externally dependent attributes that are often also time bound. Far fairer to applicant groups out there. And as a approach to finding talent, this truly supports DEI efforts. We've seen this with our clients and that they can broaden their talent pool and really find uh, new talent in different uncommon pools out there. Transferable skills across jobs and sectors yeah, and it, it ultimately, as I mentioned, it expands your talent pool to allowing you to find that, that new talent pool in different areas. 
Awesome. Thanks, Ian. I think a really, really good perspective for us and too many good quotes in there for me to, to remember offhand. I really enjoyed that. And I think when you talk about backward looking and forward looking, that additional kind of adage question that comes in, like past performance and does that predict future performance? What are your thoughts on that? Mm, that's also a very good classic one, past performance predicts future, future performance. The initial intent, I think, behind that was really that people are predictable. And thus, what I did yesterday, you can safely expect me to do again tomorrow. Now, again, in a uniform and predictable world, we can probably safely expect that. However, we all know that as far as from where we are, that's not going to be the reality. Our world is not uniform and it's not predictable. And over and above that, we also as human beings, we are complex systems. You know, we're influenced by various stimuli that make us do things that are strange sometimes and different. And there have been multiple research studies done uh, across the years, decades, that have proven that clever people do dumb things. So to frankly assume that past performance predicts future performance without taking the context that I'm in into account is an absolute recipe for disaster. We've seen context matters and context impacts your performance, so it's got to be taken into account. All right, I think let me let me wrap up my section here. So. The second area that you'll see on the slide there is around your processes and your tech. Uh, let's talk tech first there. Obviously, the question whether to AI or not to AI, in my mind, is, is important, but it's not as critical anymore. It's more around how and where do we use these various types of emerging technologies, whether it's generative AI, whether it's LLMs, for example. Our perception as HR and as professionals to tech have matured over the years, which is great. The focus, therefore, for me now is much more on how do we align the interactions, our use, our interface, our collaboration between humans and machines a lot better, but then also to make it be very deliberate and intentional uh, with the technology that we do use and that we deploy. So to make sure it has a clear purpose and doesn't try to do everything, but just does what it's meant to be doing. So when talking HR, so I think when I'm talking to when it talks HR and HR tech, we've got to keep it simple and keep it focused on that. The other element there in terms of processes. Um, and here, very simply, it's about how do we force HR to move away from mostly business-centered processes to candidate-centered uh, processes. So practically, we can see this, if you look very quickly at talent acquisition, we are able to now source in new talent pools. We attract in different ways with messaging that's more centered around the candidates and not around the employer. Um, we assess with empowering and personalized experiences very different to what was done previously. So there are really very practical ways in which talent acquisition has changed. And similarly in talent management, um, a big thing that's become a lot more real in the last few years is on-demand data access. If I need the data today to make critical decisions, I cannot wait till tomorrow. I've got to need it and access it today. Um, similarly, challenging biases. The value of being able to use technology and processes that can help me identify hidden gems that break those stereotypes. I think that's so empowering to challenge mindset into an event with, with line managers and fellow HR professionals. And in that way, again, broadening the talent search and really finding that good talent, but in very uncommon places then. Yeah, I love the um, just the phraseology around like, break the stereotypes and removing some of this bias. And I can definitely see some of the practical and the positive impacts um, that these types of change will actually have on things like B&I. And I. Um, my question is, how is this going to impact actual talent strategy? Yeah, so if you look at that talent strategy element, Lucy, I think that's the one part that we often underestimate. You know, obviously, with change, there's a direct impact on the type of new talent that's needed by businesses and where in the business that talent is required and must be deployed. And even also where we can find that talent internally and externally. Um, we work with a number of customers globally um, that are leading this change in talent strategy, which is super exciting, but they often do it in very specific roles or specific talent segments like graduate, let's say. Um, mm. What's great with this is that we have these HR professionals on the ground that internally really, really lead the rewiring and the redesign of their talent strategy for that uh, talent segment, um, which in many cases has resulted in industry recognition, which is very exciting for them, obviously, and also even them winning awards. Um, but the one part, however, that I think that we do underestimate that's often not driven also with as much passion uh, um, is how the mechanics and the architecture 
behind the behavioral and cultural changes are also rewired to sustain that change. And here we're talking basics, we're talking KPAs, business metrics, expectations um, and deliverables, reporting lines, organizational design. Um, these elements, we can't drive a behavioral and cultural change with great marketing behind it, but without the mechanical change. You know, we've got to challenge both, to make sure that we realize the value of our talent with a much more sustainable and complete change in the talent strategy. And if we can balance both off, I think then we have a much, much better focus on that. I think I've done enough speaking. I think we should move on to Sahel speaking. <laughs> yeah, let's get Sahel speaking. Cool, thanks, Jürgen. Um, really good perspectives for us to consider. I wanna take a very quick breather just for some questions that have come in. Um, so we've got two from Brandon and one from Sylvia. I think let's do Sylvia's one first. Um, Sylvia mentioned, are there clues to this? How do we as humans embrace all this technology? Um, and I personally, um, and I, I, I think I mentioned this a bit earlier in our session, there's just so much change in the rapid expansion of things that even just staying on top of things sometimes feels, feels quite tricky to do. Um, Lucy, Jan, what are your thoughts on how we can approach this? I, for me, the thing that comes top of mind, um, it's a really good question, Sylvia. <laughs> Who knows the answer? Um, but I think the the thing that we're seeing is that um, when we're looking at what people do we want in our business to bring in and develop and, and lead our companies, is probably thinking around some of those softer skills. If I hate that term, but you know, some of those more enduring things about how we behave, like people that are curious, that are flexible, that want to learn these new technologies, that are open to change, um, that probably are a little bit more resilient is probably looking for people that have got those types of uh, behaviours alongside them that are going to do really well in the face of change. So I think that's the, you know, looking at who do you need in the business to drive innovation, to embrace change, to embrace technology. And that's probably a mindset shift to what we might have been looking for prior to this fourth industrial revolution. And I would just add to Lucy's element, absolutely. Um, and just focus on what matters most and what's going to have the biggest impact for that organization because there's a lot one can change and one lot one should be focusing on the trick is always with having many many data points with so many great systems etc is that you often get flooded with having too many data points and you don't then you almost get paralyzed and i think that's what so many hr teams fall into the trap with is that yeah you might have a lot of data but it doesn't mean it's good data what you need is good data to answer specific questions so that you can make specific actions or next steps so be deliberate and focus on what matters the most to you mm. awesome thanks guys i think really good perspectives i would just add that skills like digital literacy almost and that digital savviness like those emerging skills over the years that have come up time and time again are surfacing again and that's definitely something we're seeing as well from a expectation of thriving in today's work workplace um, I've got one more that I want to tackle now because I think it's it's perfect timing as we move into the impact on employees is Brandon's um, comment, which is a great one as well. So I'll read that out quickly. While the sense is that employees have greater power in terms of their decisions, a global marketplace may ironically reduce their power. So by being able to seek employees globally, they are not necessarily bound to the demands of those employees. And then Brandon's question is, or is he just being pessimistic? Um, a really good view, um, challenging thought for us. Um, and you and Lucy, just interested if you have any thoughts um, on that one as well. Mm. I think from, from my side, the good question, Brandon, and thanks for that. Globalization obviously brings to it its own challenges entirely, you know, and, it's, and depending on the person, on the context as well, in some cases it works, some cases it doesn't work. So it becomes, in my, in my opinion, a very complex cocktail of a mix that one has to navigate through to be able to put that person into an environment where they can feel empowered or can get out of it what they were intending. And sometimes I think that's where that uncertainty of the change in work comes in, is that sometimes one is uncertain saying, hey, we're gonna put you over here now and let's try this, but we're very uncertain whether that's gonna work. And I think if one is real about the fact that that uncertainty is gonna be top of mind and is gonna stress us out and put us into uncomfortable zones, um, as long as we're real about it and can work with that, then I guess one can together navigate that uncertainty a lot better versus expecting that people will be able to perform and will feel empowered at the same time. So I think being real about the challenges that they're gonna experience as well. 
Yeah, I would just also, I don't think you're being um, pessimistic, Brandon. I think you're quite rightfully challenging us to think differently here. Um, and I guess that part of your question is saying employees have more opportunity to leave the job and go elsewhere. They have a stronger voice because they have more global opportunity, but also organisations have more global opportunity to find people across the world. And so actually, where does the power sit? The one thing I would say is that we do have a global talent shortage and that isn't you know, gloom and doom headlines, that is the reality. We won't have enough people to do the jobs that we have today. And in the future, that's only going to get worse. So in that respect, I think that the, that's where a big part of the power does shift to the employee, that there are more in, you know, it's supply and demand and there, um, there isn't enough supply of employees to fill the jobs that organisations have had. And that's why I think the power is really shifting to an employee. Mm. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Jan. I think such a complex piece of, you know, moving parts that happen all the time in terms of what you need now and in the future and where that power lives in terms of does it sit just with employees, just with employers? Is it a constant like up and down piece? Um, so really good question. I see there's a couple more things in the chat. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to shift gears and get us to the third section so that we can start addressing some of these questions, because some of these do relate to the employee experience. Um, and, and that takes us to that very last section in terms of employee-led careers and the change in career expectations that we've seen. Um, so Lucy and Jörn, I know you guys both have done a, a fantastic job on your sections, but before I let you off the hook, um, this is always a question I love asking, um, especially when we get into the topic of careers, and that is growing up, what did you want to be? Um, Lucy, do you mind sharing with us first? I don't. I do dislike this question. I never know how to answer it. I don't know that I had a specific thing that comes to mind of what I wanted to be when I grew up. But what I will say is I have asked my children this recently um, and I've got loads of different answers from them. Um, teacher and vet are predominantly what comes up for my daughter. And then things like robot and dog tend to come up from my son. Uh, that tells you a lot about my kids. Um, but what it always makes me think is two things I guess. Um, one, they should be aspiring to have more than one thing that they might be in the future, um, not just to keep their options open, but also could she not be a vet and then a teacher and then do something else. But uh, And also the other thing that I think, because teacher's a big one for her, she's very sort of caring, compassionate, likes to help others. Um, but I really wonder what the role of things like a teacher will be in the future, like how much is that job going to change by the time my daughter actually enters the workplace um, and it feels a bit scary right now but you know we'll we'll have to wait and see yeah thanks lucy um and and i think what we've seen and and this is so interesting i mean i'll share mine very quickly so growing up i wanted to become a pilot because my grandfather thought it was a very prestigious career choice and the role was really you know highly respected and then it would lead to a very comfortable life a good standard of living etc and well, today I'm here. I'm not a pilot, but I did enjoy the new Top Gun Maverick movie. And um, today I'm really passionate um, about coffee. So I have a basic um, barista course done and dusted. And I'm convinced one day that I'll own my own cafe. And that's a little bit of my dream. Um, but this is what, the, you know, the, this brings us nicely to this point of no longer do you have that job for life or career for life. And we've seen this transition for, for employees specifically as well in terms of being impacted by the future of work. And that's the idea of a second career or third career, things like gig work or side hustles, um, pursuing passion in terms of what gives you so much energy. Um, and as, as both Lucy and Jörn have mentioned in their different sections, we need to design organizations and work around humans and adopt that people-centric approach. Um, and people, what they're passionate about and what brings them joy and energy does definitely change over time. So something that organizations are having to deal with and address um, is giving employees that option to really explore, understand themselves better, and the responsibility of the organization is putting those tools in place so that people can learn, grow, and develop. One of the other challenges we've seen is how organizations think about employee experience, which is encompassing all of those interactions and perceptions of an organization and the employer brand. Now, according to AIHR, the employee experience is the HR equivalent of that customer experience, um, which is an inside, an outside-in approach requiring us to empathize with and focus on what customers want. And this is exactly the same for employee experience, working on the same idea, 
that employees are the organization's internal customers. And we, un we need to understand their needs, expectations, and then fears in terms of how these change in order to be up to date and giving people what they need so they can grow their career with your organization. And the goal is to really create an experience that demonstrates care for employees within that context of their work. So that employee centric approach is essential to modern workplaces and workplaces of the future, which focuses on things like empowerment and engaging employees and companies that deliver a great employee experience, achieve incredible things. And some of those outcomes that we strive towards as organizations, and we have plenty of research out there on the benefit of this. So like research from Gallup, as an example, where we saw companies with highly engaged employees outperform competitors by almost 140% um, in earnings per share. And also research from organizations like the Corporate Leadership Council, who found that engaged employees are 87% less likely to leave. So we see a massive difference in terms of retaining key talent. And this is even more important given the global shortage that we've spoken about today. We consistently see that a positive experience leads to great outcomes like productivity and performance, increased retention, lower turnover, et cetera. When we talk about the employee experience, there are various models out there and two of which you'll see on screen now. So the one from AIHR and the other one from Deloitte, which includes elements of things like the physical environment. So what I experience in terms of my senses, et cetera, the technological environment. So that piece Jörn spoke about in terms of what tech you need, um, and how we utilize that in, in the workforce. And then almost to that point that Lucy mentioned on cultural environment in terms of how the organization shows up, its personality, um, what it accepts and tolerates, et cetera, and creating that purse for human, uh, you know, real um, workplace for humans to really thrive. And then on the right-hand side, in terms of the Deloitte model, you can see the kind of things we're aspiring towards and the experience we want to create. So there's lots of things. Um, that have a, a massive influence on organizations, how they deal with talent, and then how they retain them. Another change we've seen, and we've alluded to this in our conversation today, is that rise of the employee-led career um, or employee-led development and organizations needing to adapt to this. With employee-led careers and development, it allows employees to take ownership of their careers, connect to others in different roles, and then identify career experiences that they want to have while closing out skills gaps, pursuing those new opportunities. So rather than relying solely on the direction and decisions of management, employees take a proactive approach to how they approach their career goals, um, acquire those relevant skills, and then seek the opportunities for growth and advancement. Now, what you'll see on screen in a moment is also that move and what that means for us. So when we think of traditional career models and approaches, so maybe a predefined career path or a set job assignment, or progression is only through vertical promotion, um, we, we often have seen that this has changed now in terms of how employees think about their careers and what they expect. And they are moving towards autonomy to explore different options, really taking that ownership and owning their journey. And progress here might be constant opportunity to learn and grow, as opposed to working my way up the organization, because that might not be what gives someone energy. Not everyone wants to be a manager. And, and we should focus on what those experiences are and how we create an environment that's conducive to that type of employee as well. What we can also see, um, and, and we've heard this often, is that professional development element and where that responsibility lives. So there's a part for the employee to play, but also a part for the employer. Lucy and Jörn, this comes up really frequently in conversations that I have with my clients. Can you briefly share what you've heard from clients in terms of what this change in employee experience, in terms of careers um, they've experienced and, and almost what they're doing to address this? Let me go first. When you said employee-led careers, um, that resonated a lot. That's what I hear um, quite a lot from clients. And I think that's around, there's a shift that I see in the industry of talent management in general, talent management and development over the last 15 years, which has been traditionally, we really focused on leadership development and top talent or high potentials, really a small proportion of the people that we employ. And now we're seeing organisations much more wanting to focus on lower levels in the business and this idea of development for all. Um, you know, we're seeing much more attention on first-line managers, um, individual contributors, and actually, you know, putting it in the, into the hands of these individuals to say, here's some feedback that you can take forward, here's some development opportunities, here's what you can do to lead your and drive your own career wherever you might want that to be. Um, mm -hmm. So that 
yeah, when you said career uh, employee led careers, that struck a chord for me because I hear that a lot. Mm, I agree with you, Lucy, and I think from Asa, what I've observed um, with, from customers is just how uh, flexible working arrangements um, and how organizations and colleagues are completely accepting and respecting new ways of flexible working, whether that may be availability of a person, whether it's hours in a day or days in a week or locations or so or, or type of working. I think that um, openness to accommodating that and working with it. I think is amazing how that's changed in the last few years. So that's that's been a big positive shift as well. Awesome. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Jared. I think really good feedback in terms of what you've also heard from customers um, and completely agree. I, I know we've only got a few minutes left and I see there are quite a few questions in the chat that are building up. So before we wrap up this section, I quickly want to share because this often comes up for us practical steps so clients ask us how do we start this journey if, if we're not if we're not quite ready yet or maybe we are on this um journey so far but there's other things that we know we can do so what we've what we've got for you today and these are what you see on screen now how to make this practical in terms of thinking of an employee-led career and experience and um, i'm not going to spend too much time here but you can see things like providing development resources and portals to things like creating learning cultures um, and really sharing success stories of where people have made these shifts and moves in their careers and really giving a voice to those um, and, and getting that out to your organization. And um, things like promoting job rotation and cross-functional opportunities to really give employees the chance to really experience things and um, see what they like, enjoy, and what gives them energy. Things like supporting um, networking and mentoring as well, so both internally and externally um, for your organization. And then also things like encouraging that work-life balance, flexibility, et cetera. So lots of practical steps that organizations can take to start their journeys, depending on um, where they are and, and what they need to do at that point in time. Now, in order for organizations to do this, we know that the starting point is often knowing what they have, being in tune with what those people want and expect. And at SHL, we've supported many clients with their journeys of understanding their people, firstly at an organizational wide level, and then all the way down to an individual level. And for us, what we have seen and heard from clients consistently is that those workforces are changing. Both Yen and Lucy spoke around this in terms of um, mixed generations and mixed expectations, and we need to cater for those, ranging from where things had started, so previously focusing on job stability and loyalty, like was mentioned, moving all the way to the Gen Z, entering the workplace, which might be more tech savvy, maybe more entrepreneurial in how they approach things. And maybe that focus is a bit different in terms of making that impact on society. So we're definitely seeing a lot of changes in this space, uh, which opens up plenty of opportunities for organizations, but also for employees. Once you know what you have, what those expectations are, what motivates you, et cetera, you can then pivot and be agile in your talent management approach. And this is what we support our clients with day in and day out. This brings us to the final part of our conversation and what a great conversation it has been. Um, so thank you again, Lucy and Ewan. Um, before we wrap up, I quickly want to hear any top tips and recommendations or bits of advice that you have um, that you'd like to give our audience. Yeah. Okay, I will go first. I think that the one thing, my top tip when it comes to the changing world of work would be don't lose sight of your people. Um, it sounds a bit corny, but a lot of the future of work is going to be driven by some of these external realities of tech, innovation, even, you know, we're seeing geopolitics come into play in the workplace um, today a lot more. So I think the more we can remain human, and think about how these changes are actually going to impact on our people, not just making decisions without really thinking about that impact. And, um, you know, definitely we're going to have brighter organizations and happier places to work. So that's my top tip. Mm, thanks, Lucy. Great point. Um, my top tip would be focus on the HR side of things. And I think firstly, uh, change is constant, as you all know. So, but the sooner you move with the wave and not fight the water, the better you'll be able to swim with that change. So don't fight it. Um, secondly, yesterday's solution might not suit tomorrow's opportunity. So be inquisitive, ask questions, challenge yourself more than you challenge others. And I think lastly, when challenging yesterday's solution you know, for tomorrow's opportunity, Challenge both the culture, the thinking, the behaviors, so the soft elements, but also then the mechanisms, the architectures, the policies around that. 
don't expect change to come through with only moving one of those dials. You've got to move both and influence both. Thanks, Sohail. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Lucy. Um, closing kind of comments from my side in terms of a top tip as well is a lot of this can feel, feel overwhelming. I, I know Sylvia had that comment a bit earlier and absolutely how a lot of us you know, feel today. Loads of information. It's more accessible than ever. And just keeping up to date can feel quite, quite challenging at times. Um, and just remember, you are human. Um, you are not a robot. You are not artificial intelligence. So be kind to yourself. Be kind to others. And let's do the best we can. And remember for us, the future is human. So let's keep the human and human resources. That's my corny bit for, um, for the last part. Um, what you can see on screen um, is a QR code to share feedback on the session. Tell us also what you'd like to hear more about. And what we'll do over the next few minutes before we close out the session is just work through some of the comments and feedback that we have in the chat that we haven't answered as yet. Um, so again, if you don't mind, please scanning that, um, that code. We want to keep the conversation going and show you how we actually support our clients with their initiatives. So if you are interested on the previous slide, there was um, our LinkedIn QR codes that you can scan to follow us, ask questions and engage with us. And then also this one to elicit feedback and also just get input into the type of topics you would love to, um, to hear about. Perfect, let me jump over to the chat for us and then I can pull up a couple um, for us to work through. Um, there was a really interesting one from Terry, um, who's a talent acquisition uh, professional, um, who shared, what perspectives do you have in addressing the bias in both generative AI as it is fed our current prompts versus the bias in our current human TA teams? How do we continue to train and address that bias that AI may have just as we do with our human hiring processes? I'll take a quick stab and then Lucy Ewan would love your views on this as well. I think AI will learn from the behavior we teach it. So ethics in AI, in, in AI is, is so topical right now and how we have to strike that balance right in terms of feeding it the right information, teaching it the right things, because AI will pick up on bias that we give it. So just something that we need to be cognizant of when we do give prompts, when we feed this technology machine, we need to make sure that we think about the good and the bad we could do. And almost keeping that top of mind for me is a good way to actively catch ourselves out uh, to not make it do things that we don't want it to do. Mm. Lucy, Ian, any thoughts from your side? Yeah, I'll maybe just add to that. I think we've also seen where we do use AI. I mean, we love the idea of AI and we use it in a couple of our solutions, but always with caution because we don't want it to accidentally bias, as you said, Terry, against applicant groups or so. Um, but where we have seen it really work well is that where we've not only bought it certain ways of scoring and so on, but actually changed the scoring mechanism to not make the scoring mechanism as binary. So to be able to allow for a wider catchment of possible responses that are good enough to come through for us to be able to identify top talent. And, and that's been actually a, a really effective way for us to broaden our, again, our talent pool of shortlisted applicants from previously uh, disadvantaged groups that had natural biases baked against into them or into them against them, if I can call it that. Um, but that's where AI actually has worked well. So I think they both, both would have to be massaged on an ongoing basis, but it's definitely possible. And one just be clever about how you affect the scoring on the AI side. Do you see anything you awesome. want to add? I'm very aware of time. I will just say, I think this is going to be a new job for psychologists. I think it's going to be an emerging role that will actually be, how do we train? How do we monitor? And how do we course correct AI to make sure that we keep bias out of it? It's something as psychologists that we've always been really good at, and it's been a big part of our jobs. Um, so, you know, I think we can do it. One final one is, um, it is a real question. It's a really good question, Terry. A, a colleague of ours at SHL actually uh, head of diversity went and asked AI to generate images of a cleaner and it disproportionately brought up images of women and people of color outside of what the representation is of those two demographics within that um, within that job. So it is happening. Um, we know that it is and it, it's on all of us, I think, to make sure that we're questioning, we're monitoring and we're course correcting. Absolutely. Um, I see we are on time um, for, um, for the session. So there might be some questions that we haven't quite got to today. 
Um, we will do our best to make sure that we do provide you with a, a response post this session. Um, and thank you again so much for the time, for tuning in. We hope it's been a valuable session. Um, and Lucy, Yearn, thank you so much for joining me today and, and being presenters for this. Such an interesting topic. Really appreciate your insights and views. Thanks, Sohel. Thanks, Lucy. And thanks to all yeah. of you for joining. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day further. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.